Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this year's uh, session of the National Hurricane Conference in Orlando, Florida. Uh, good morning. My name is John Wilson. I'm serving as this year's planning chair for the uh, conference. Hopefully, those of you who were in our training sessions earlier this week I got a lot out of them, and those that are here for the general session and the workshops tomorrow will also think the same as we, as we get finished. Before we start with our general plenary speakers this morning, I'd like to take a moment to thank our 2014 conference sponsors. Uh, their generous support helps make uh, this meeting more enjoyable for everyone. Our thanks to Phillips and Jordan for the tote bags, uh, CBI and I for the um, name badge wallets, Crowder Golf for the uh, Tervis tumblers, Wood O'Brien for the Internet Cafe, and the Lewis Burger Group for for the ballpoint pens. Let's have a round of applause for our 2014 conference sponsors. Our first speaker today is uh, Dr. Richard Nabb, who is the current uh, director of the National Hurricane Center. Uh, Dr. Nabb received his bachelor's degree in atmospheric science uh, from Purdue University and his master's and doctorate in meteorology from Florida State. Uh, he was a research meteorologist and lead forecaster at the Monacoa Weather Center from 1999 to 2001. Later that year, he joined NOAA's National Hurricane Center as a science and operations officer and was a senior hurricane specialist there until 2008. Uh, he then became the deputy director for NOAA's uh, Central Pacific Hurricane Center in Honolulu uh, and then uh, served in that capacity until 2010 when he joined the Weather Channel as their on-air hurricane expert and Tropical Science Program Manager. He rejoined uh, the National Hurricane Center in 2012 as its director. Uh, Dr. Nab will be going over last year's hurricane season and perhaps some other topics that are of interest to him. Dr. Nab. Here's a little. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for coming, everyone. Good morning. Great to see you all here. Uh, already been a wonderful week of interactions. Uh, with our partners in emergency management and media, disaster safety, and all kinds of folks uh, that we've had a chance to uh, learn from and provide training and have some very productive discussions. In fact, I was asked a couple of times, at least yesterday, in media interviews, why is this conference so important? And the main answer that I gave that I think is the shortest, best answer that encompasses so much of what we do here is that the face-to-face -face time and building the relationships in this very large but passionate and focused community is what enables us to really get better at what we do and be prepared to serve the public that we all care so much about uh, when the next hurricane threatens. And uh, there will be more hurricanes, and we all have to be ready. And that's part of what I'm going to talk about today. How do we get the public focused on preparedness, and I think a large part of that is a strategy whereby we focus on the hazards. And there are a lot of other topics very closely related or perhaps just loosely related to getting prepared for the next hurricane that I want to address today and also explain to you why it is we are moving in the directions that we are at the National Hurricane Center in terms of uh, making some new products and warnings available and enhancing what we do in a way that focuses the public's attention uh, on the hazards. Uh, already a lot of discussion out there about what the upcoming season uh, might be like. And in general, on the topic of seasonal activity and understanding what drives that and the science behind it and trying to push the envelope on what we as meteorologists are able to do in terms of forecasting, I fully support that continued endeavor uh, when it comes to the seasonal forecasts. We do all have a collective challenge, however, every year in messaging to the public about what they can and cannot do with the information that comes with the seasonal forecast. I've always seen it as a good on-ramp to talking about a lot of other topics involving hurricane preparedness, and I will want to uh, solicit your help in doing that again this year. And it's often the case that when the forecast is for a, a way above average uh, season that uh, we get the public's attention that way. It's a good story. People want to hear about it. But does that guarantee that we're going to have impacts where 
people in the U.S. live? Is that guarantee any particular international location is going to be struck? Of course not. Uh, 2010 is one example of a very above average year. Lots of hurricanes, several major hurricanes. Not one hurricane came ashore in the United States. Certainly other areas impacted uh, very severely, and we did have impacts in the U.S., but not a hurricane. So even after a busy year, you often hear uh, folks, even my own friends and family at times, say, what happened this year? I thought it was going to be a really bad year. And again, we have to make the distinction between busy or not and bad or not. And that's a very local issue. It's really all about where the hurricanes go. And so I've always worried about what will happen uh, whenever it occurs that uh, seasonal forecasts come out saying that we're anticipating an average year, a below average year. Does that make us feel any better? So let me make for you right now a pretend seasonal hurricane forecast. Doesn't matter what year it is, let's just pretend it's any old year and the director of the Hurricane Center gets up in front of you and says, and I would never do this by the way, gets up in front of you and says, I can guarantee you with 100% certainty that this year there will be seven storms, four hurricanes, and one major hurricane, below average overall throughout the Atlantic, Gulf, and Caribbean. Would that make us feel any better? I suspect we would see some stories out there leaning folks in that direction. I suspect some of my family members, some of whom live not too far away from me in South Florida and other hurricane-prone parts of the country would say, wow, looking like a pretty good year, looking like a quiet year. And let's say that forecast turned out to be 100% accurate, as I guaranteed. And what if that year was 1992? I don't think we give any attention to the seasonal forecast numbers after a major impact like an Andrew. And I know that to a large extent I'm preaching to the choir here, that we all have seen and heard this example, and that we know that past history teaches us that the seasonal forecast doesn't always tell us what the impacts are going to be. In fact, it never really does when you think locally. But I would urge you to help us collectively get the message out that we have to prepare this year just like we would every year. And one way I go about that is to remind folks that I and the other folks work at the Hurricane Center, you're going to hear from Chris Lancy later today on, on understanding uh, our risk based on historical hurricane activity. And I've got lots of our other dedicated staff from the Hurricane Center here providing training and interacting with you all. And one thing I remind folks is that we at the Hurricane Center are not just scientists, meteorologists, and I'll call myself one computer geek, okay? We live the hurricane problem too. And I tell people how I'm preparing, and I'm doing nothing different this year than I did last year or the year before. We have to prepare the same way every year. And now some might say, well, 1992, I've heard of that example. I know below average year, and we still had Andrew. But, you know, that was pretty unusual, wasn't it? 1983. I don't see anything going on in the deep tropics of any significance. The numbers are even smaller than 1992. And I personally went through Hurricane Alicia in Houston, Texas. And I was a lot younger then than I am now, but I don't even remember what the overall seasonal activity was for quite a bit of time after Alicia came through. I didn't care. And so it's not all that uncommon for us to have really severe impacts in a year when it's below average. It's also not uncommon for us to not get as many landfalls as we think we were perceiving would be the case based on a forecast of an above average year. So again, it's good science. I support its pursuit. We have to message it properly. Please help us do that and not let seasonal activity levels, seasonal forecasts get in the way and be a distraction for the real preparedness activities that the public needs to be engaging in. And again, 
The seasonal forecast, it, it needs to be out there. It's going to be out there. We can't avoid that. And there's a lot to talk about, but I hope we will continue to use it as an on-ramp to talking about real preparedness activities that people can do. So let's talk about some real-world information. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes and Leslie Chapman Henderson for allowing me to, to show this information and her, her sharing it uh, with me uh, based on a, a Harris Interactive survey commissioned by Flash uh, just very recently that provides us an insight, several insights actually, into what the public is thinking and what they understand and what they don't understand and what we have some challenges in terms of uh, clarifying and getting people better prepared. The, the top hurricane myth they identified in their survey this year, you see in the middle there, uh, is one that really resonates with uh, an issue that I'm trying to bring a tremendous amount of focus to, and that's evacuation and being well aware of whether or not you as a resident in a hurricane prone area might ever need to evacuate. And the, the survey result is, is striking. It says that 84% of those surveyed think they need to evacuate based on the strength or wind speed of a hurricane. Now, there are a lot of nuances buried in this question and the answer, and we all, of course, know, those of us who are directly involved in forecasting and modeling and, and designing evacuation zones and dealing with these things, that the strength of a hurricane has something to do with what storm surge has produced and who we decide to evacuate. But as we all know, it is one of many considerations in what results in what storm surge in any particular location. And we've learned the hard way over the last decade just how important the horizontal size of a tropical storm or a hurricane is to what storm surge you get, in addition to the bathymetry and the shape of the coastline and the angle of approach and the forward speed and all of that. But I still encounter people, including friends and family, I love them, but I still need to educate them too, that will say things like, without any real additional information except their own perceptions and, and own experience, that, well, I'm going to stay for a category one or two and maybe a three, but for a four or five, I'm out of here, you know? And they don't really know, really, why, what's the real reason that they are pre-deciding that based on actual risk to what hazards where they live. It's, it's more of a perception. It's more of a comfort level. Uh, it's familiarity with that scale, but not really understanding the nuances. And of course, we all know, as it states in the, in the fact below there, that, that storm surge is the greatest overall in general. Of course, we have multiple hazards, winds, tornadoes, storm surge, inland flooding, river flooding, flash flooding. We have multiple hazards to deal with, and they all can take lives, and all have taken lives. But overall, you look at the numbers, look at the last decade, storm surge, the greatest threat to life and property from a hurricane, and you can't use the wind speed, even looking back, to say, oh, that one was a big storm surge problem, and that one wasn't. Look at all of the hurricanes that have struck the United States after 2005, which is the last time we had a Category 3 or stronger with Wilma hit this country. But look at all the major impacts that we have had with lower maximum wind speeds, with Ike, and with Irene, and Isaac, Debbie, Sandy, all the water problems that we've had. And so we really do need to educate the public about understanding their risk to storm surge. Many folks don't understand the hazard to begin with, don't understand their vulnerability to it, and don't realize that the reason that they would need to evacuate is primarily, not exclusively of course, but primarily due to the storm surge hazard, but they don't even know if they live in a hurricane evacuation zone. And so I think that's one of the big challenges and actions that we could take out of this result. And I think it's actually two phases in terms of our continued and hopefully enhanced outreach and education effort collectively on the issue of evacuation and storm surge. One is that I really do believe people need to know today whether or not they live in a storm surge evacuation zone. That 
is an excellent starting point for anybody's preparedness plan because that can then affect so many other parts of the plan that we continue to urge people that they need to have. But so many of them aren't even off to a good start. If you don't know if you would ever have to evacuate for storm surge, then you probably haven't thought through how you're going to get where you're going to go if told to evacuate by your local officials. You probably haven't thought through the insurance ramifications of flood versus other perils very thoroughly. You probably haven't thought through what supplies you're really going to need if you're going to have to take something with you. You probably haven't thought through what you're going to have to do to your home before you evacuate. And we, as you'll see in a little bit, at the Hurricane Center are, are trying to give more visibility to the storm surge hazard with new products this year, new warnings next year is the plan. But if people don't have a basic understanding of their risk to the hazard and don't plan accordingly in advance, then their response in real time to these new tools we are providing and ultimately, most importantly, their response to local officials telling them to evacuate from said zone probably isn't going to go as well. So that's one myth that we definitely need to bust, that it's just based on category, it's just based on wind. Uh, we, we need to respect all the hazards, wind and water, and get people knowing about their evacuation zone ahead of time and following their local officials' evacuation instructions in real time. Uh, Flash and company are, are starting a, a Twitter campaign. If you are on that platform, look at the hashtag Bust a Myth, and I'm sure you're going to be very enlightened in the discussions uh, from the public and others about this uh, issue. A couple of other myths that they are identifying and we're going to be trying to bust. One is, there on the left, still over half of the folks surveyed think that taping your windows is a good idea to keep yourself safe. And we all know that that's a waste of time, waste of money, and doesn't increase your safety. In fact, in some cases, can compromise your safety even more. And I have a personal experience with the taping the windows thing. Back in 1979, growing up in South Florida, my family and I were getting ready for the potential impacts of Hurricane David. And all I remember about David because it didn't strike us uh, at our home where we live, is scraping that darn tape off the windows in 95 degree heat for the next month and a half. I had to help. So, uh, so that's something we're still working on. I don't mind saying go tapeless many, many times. It gets the point across pretty quickly. And then finally, you see the other myth there that uh, uh, more than two thirds of folks think it costs more than $10,000 to strengthen their home. And there are many cost effective ways. Uh, it costs a lot less than that. Uh, to, to strengthen your home. So certainly be uh, following uh, this campaign and this discussion uh, as we go forward. Now back to the evacuation issue a little bit and I'm going to head back into the storm surge changes that we're going to be making. Uh, one other thing that they found out in the survey is about two-thirds of communities uh, that responded with uh, information about how they uh, or do they put evacuation zone information online. Based on all that, about two-thirds of the communities over 200, have evacuation zone maps available online for the public. So we need to be pointing people to these resources. But we know, of course, that's not the only way to reach people. And I would encourage us to really challenge ourselves to find easier ways for the public to find out if they're vulnerable to storm surge, if they're in an evacuation zone. There are lots of different ways to attack this issue, but I'm convinced that we simply don't make it easy enough to find out a Pretty simple piece of information when you boil it down is am I in an evacuation zone? Am I vulnerable to storm surge? However you do it locally, that's the information we want to get out. And I think that will help uh, folks get better prepared. But I want to show you a couple of examples just to make it real for us, right? We don't want to just think of numbers, we want to think of real people. Uh, even if the evacuation zone information is out there, are people finding it and do they understand what zone they live in? Let's find out from a couple of do examples. Do you live in an evacuation zone? I don't think so. I don't know. Do you oh, it's all east of 95, right? Yes, I am. Do you have an evacuation plan? No. <laughs> um, do you mean if I know the route where I have to go, or do you mean? Right, do you have a plan in case? Uh, of a hurricane, yes, of course. Supplies stacked up and But how to what evacuate, else? how to evacuate? I don't know. I have to ask my husband. Isn't that what that old women say? <laughs> Sorry. So she was asked the question, do you live in an evacuation zone? And the very first words out of her mouth, very quickly, were, I don't know. And I'm not 
going to put the blame on her. I think that's, an, that's a we problem, that we need to do more to get that information out. We can't convince everybody to seek this information out. We can't convince every last person on the planet to prepare as much as we want them to do. But I think we can do more. Here's another example. Do you live in an evacuation zone? Uh, well, I'm not sure. I don't know if it is or not. Do you have an evacuation plan? Of course. Get in the car and go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I live on the water, so I don't know if that means that. Did you hear what he said on the way out? I live on the water. Okay. So let's get the word out. Uh, these folks need us to be more clear. These folks and others need us to make it easier to find this information. As soon as I can, I'm, I'm a iPhone person, and uh, as soon as I can ask Siri, wherever it is that I'm standing, do I, am I standing in an evacuation zone? And I can find out the answer to that as easily as who's the catcher for the Florida Marlins, then I'll be happy. My Marlins, sorry. Okay. Uh, but anyway, we, we need to make it easier. And it, it's, it's often the focus of the, the, the scientists that we want to get out information. What is storm surge? How do we forecast it? What models do we use? But you know, that's fine. We need to do that, especially for the folks who are interested. But we need to get the information that's simple and actionable into people's hands. So just as a visual aid, I'm not going to get into details. I, want you, I actually want you to go online to your particular state or locality to look at evacuation zones. But just some snapshots from Florida just to drive home the point that this is not just a beachfront property problem. There are places in the state of Florida and in other places around the U.S. where evacuation zones extend not just blocks inland, but miles inland. Some cases, more than 10 or 20. And so this is a question, are you in a zone, that we need to be asking throughout the hurricane-prone portions of the U.S. And I would say, for example, that that would include every last person in the state of Florida, and here's why. Number one, I remember getting uh, contacted by people who live here in the Orlando area when I was on the national media that uh, they were asking, well, I'm in Orlando, can the storm surge get here? Okay, so let's not presume that people, just by default, if they live so far inland, already know that storm surge is not their problem. And also because of the issue that we don't want people to presume that just because they're, they can't see the water from their beach town condo, uh, that, uh, that it's not a problem for them. But here's the other issue. I want people in Orlando looking into this issue on behalf of some of their friends and family members. If you find out personally that you don't live in an evacuation zone, I hope that you would connect with some friends or family members that maybe they do live in an evacuation zone, and then you can be part of the whole plan for them and be their inland evacuation mm -hmm. destination. So it really is a conversation we need to be having throughout all the hurricane-prone states. So let's help people find out this information. Now, that's the beforehand, that's the, that's the preparation part. Now we are also trying to give more visibility to the storm surge hazard with our products and warnings out from the Hurricane Center. It's on us to do a better job with that, no doubt. And uh, Jamie Rome of our storm surge unit with the help of a lot of social scientists and technical folks in our storm surge unit, uh, supported by FEMA and so many others, there's just so many people who've been involved in the development and uh, background work that's a lot on this new product that will be available on the Hurricane Center website in real time this year for any land-threatening hurricane or maybe even a tropical storm if uh, we get to the stage where we put a watch up. That's generally the time frame. And this is just a prototype. This is not exactly how it will look online. Uh, but I know many of you have seen some examples of this graphic and our storm surge unit folks are working really hard even as we speak, I'm pretty sure, uh, getting ready to make this available in real time on an experimental basis this, this coming hurricane season. A couple of reasons I'm really excited about this product. One is that it will enable us to do what words fail miserably at, and that is to clearly convey in a forecast sense, given the uncertainties in track intensity and size that are already built into this graphic, how far inland could the water go? And we've not been communicating that well in public forecast products up to this point. And in a case here in southeastern Texas, you can see in this mock example just how far inland there is the potential for flooding over normally dry ground from the Gulf of Mexico due to storm surge. The other thing I'm excited about is that it 
levels the playing field in terms of how to interpret it. It's, it's conveying how high above ground level the water could get at any particular local spot. It's a locally interpreted product. So you pick a point on the map, and that tells you how high the water could get at that location, given a reasonable assessment of the uncertainties in track intensity and size at that time. It'll be updated with every new forecast advisory. And so this is a real-time communications tool. It's a new real-time tool that we look forward to working with our emergency management partners to help in their decision-making process. It is not a description of evacuation zones. It is a tool to paint the picture more clearly for folks why it is that their emergency managers are telling them, perhaps, to evacuate. We will always, always, always be telling the public to do what their local officials tell them to do. And however much outreach and education and, and clarification that we need to continue to do once this is out there, to address whatever confusion that there might be with a new product. I would submit that that is far greater than the confusion that we have been dealing with up to now, which is really no depiction from the Hurricane Center about how far inland the water could go, how high above ground it could get, and trying to convey it in words in our, our text products and in, in our briefings. It's been very difficult. And so I welcome the opportunity to interact with you all during the experimental phase and get your feedback as we go through the season. Not that we want a landfall threat, uh, which is when this graphic would be available in real time. And if we don't get those, then we'll work on some other scenarios. So again, this is experimental coming this year. Then, in 2015, this is not for this year, but in 2015, we will be uh, targeting that year as the year that we want to debut a new storm surge watch and warning. Why is that? And why has it been something we've been headed toward for more than a decade? Because we truly believe that the hazard that has such great potential to take so many lives and do so much damage, and because it doesn't always occur, and often doesn't occur in the same place or the same time as the hurricane or tropical storm force winds, deserves its own warning to clearly communicate where we think there's a significant chance of life-threatening storm surge, another communications tool. And it will not just be a strip along the coast. This visual aid helps you see how we intend for it to highlight the areas that are at a significant risk for life-threatening surge, whether they're immediately on the beach or whether it penetrates uh, quite a ways inland. So when you look at the entire picture of what we have in our arsenal and what we're going to have in our arsenal when these new products and warnings become available, we have the ability to communicate to the public, to get them better prepared for this hazard farther in advance, and provide new tools to give more visibility to it in real time. All, I think, will greatly increase the chances of people following the local officials' evacuation instructions. So just wanted to summarize for you what we're working on. There are workshops happening all week uh, with folks from the Hurricane Center, including tomorrow, to discuss these in more detail. Also, new for this year that I wanted to highlight, and again, this still falls under the, the realm of trying to focus more on the hazards. Just because it's not a tropical depression or tropical storm yet doesn't mean we might not be contending with hazards pretty soon. And so that's why we are moving toward, uh, probably in the July time frame is when we'll have the technical work done with our hardworking staff at the Hurricane Center to get this out on the street. So around July, you should be able to see this new five-day graphical tropical weather outlook that will outline the areas that are already in the text outlook, but will convey to you in graphical form what the chances are of becoming the next tropical depression or storm in the next five days. And because it's a five-day area for the systems that are moving, it will give you some depiction of where the system is headed. And I'm really uh, excited about the potential for helping out in situations where systems are trying to form on our doorstep. And the hazards could be impacting us in less than five days. And so I'm not wanting to have to wait until we have a depression there or, or a tropical storm there to be communicating this graphically. This will enable us to give more visibility to the systems that especially are, are going to be land-threatening uh, sooner. Uh, but it will capture graphically everything that we're watching and you'll still have the text outlook to refer to. So again, this will be in the July timeframe, we'll be able to debut this this year. 
One question I would like to ask all of you to be considering throughout the next year, and I am more than happy to get your feedback on this idea here at this conference or throughout the next year. The question is, would it be beneficial for the National Hurricane Center, for the Weather Service, to be issuing watches and warnings, for example, a tropical storm watch, for a system that's in our outlook, has a high chance of formation, but isn't a tropical depression or a tropical storm yet, but it's close enough to land that maybe within the next 48 hours we could be dealing possibly with tropical storm conditions. The reason for asking that question is, again, because I want to focus more on the hazards. It isn't so clear-cut in nature that, well, this only really becomes a problem when it becomes a tropical depression or a tropical storm. Prior to that, it's just something to give a heads up and mention in the outlook. But what if we really have some significant concern that there are going to be hazards within the next 48 hours, but it's not a depression yet? Should that really keep us from issuing a tropical storm watch? Uh, my opinion would be no, but I want to hear your feedback. Just some examples of how this could be utilized. There are plenty of examples in the past where we've had systems form and intensify and cause hazardous conditions on land areas all less than 48, and in the case of Umberto, less than 24 hours. Gaston in 2004, uh, we had a great concern that it was going to form, and we could all uh, probably uh, sense that it was going to pose some kind of threat uh, to the east coast of the U.S., but we didn't pull the trigger on, on, on giving you a sense, really, of where it was going to go until it became a depression or a storm. We certainly didn't put out watches or warnings until it did so. So that's the question, and it, it, it brings forth a lot of questions in your mind, I'm sure, uh, including how would we depict it? Well, it could be certainly tied to the, to the new five-day graphical tropical weather outlook, because we'd already be talking about generally where the system's going to go. But let's think of uh, just be brainstorming here about how this could play out uh, visually. And again, this is not going to happen this year. This is something we're at the idea stage, potentially for next year or in the future beyond that. Uh, let's say, for example, you have a system approaching the Bahamas from the southeast, not unlike Katrina. Remember, Katrina didn't become a tropical storm way out in the eastern Atlantic. That happened relatively close to home. And if it's within 48 hours, could we put up watches and warnings on a satellite image just to convey where those hazardous conditions could occur associated with that system? But then the upper right is just kind of a, a crude mock-up of, well, if, if we already have a five-day area of where the system could become a tropical depression or tropical storm, why not use that depiction to superimpose uh, watches and warnings? Again, only when there's a high confidence of formation. We're not going to try to overdo it here, and I know that's a concern. But while there is uh, an important reason to not overdo this sort of thing, I would also think that this is one of those kinds of scenarios where after the fact, later we might decide we should have done that. Just think about how, how Sandy played out. Uh, if we made a change after Sandy, to issue, have the ability to issue hurricane watches and warnings even when it's post-tropical. And it, before Sandy, that idea might not have sounded quite as good because, well, we don't want to too, issue too many hurricane watches and warnings. But after we see what happens in Sandy, we think it's a good idea, clearly. And there are cases where systems form close to land and then bring hazardous conditions on land. I don't want to, there to be underwarning in such cases. So that's the motivation, and I'm interested to hear your feedback on that idea. Uh, back to where else can you get information and focus on the hazards and what should you be doing about it? One thing I've been doing is interacting with some insurance partners. I mean, we're not the experts on insurance at the Hurricane Center, but we, we get asked about it a lot. And so uh, folks involved with the National Flood Insurance Program, the Insurance Information Institute, FLASH, uh, IBHS, uh, we've been talking about collecting really good information, simple actionable pieces of information that I'm going to be trying to share with the public when we do the hurricane awareness tour, for example, this coming May. And I'm thrilled that we get to do that along the Gulf Coast uh, this coming year. Again, there are lots of in pieces of information, sources of information that we can actively point people to that can lead them to take some really important steps to make their home safer, to have the right kinds of insurance, to know their evacuation zone, to get the right kinds of supplies. I really hope that that becomes the media focus for the next several weeks leading up to the season after this conference. I hope there are plenty of hashtags talking about preparedness issues and not just the seasonal forecast and not just how last season was and not just about how wide the cone is 
this year. Those are things we need to talk about and explain, but we need to be focusing folks' attention on real-world things that they can be doing and focusing on the hazards and what they can do to be better prepared for them. I look forward to continuing the conversation with you in all kinds of ways. Social media isn't for, for everybody on a day-to-day -day basis, but I'm on there as NHC director. You can direct message me. This is a good way for us to reinforce our preparedness messages. I think if people hear the same things from multiple people and multiple credible organizations, that can strengthen things. And we at the Hurricane Center are active on the social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter. And it's just one of the tools in the box. And there are so many ways that I look forward to working with all of you and staying in touch and doing each one of our very important roles as best we can. We'll continue to try to improve our products, our services, the accuracy of our forecasts, our collaboration and coordination with all of you. But ultimately, it's about friends and family and public that we all care so much about. And we really need to focus them on the hazards and what they can do to be better prepared for the next hurricane. Looking forward to the rest of the week. Thank you for everything that you all do. Have a great week and looking forward to talking with you some more. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Craig Fugate, who serves as our, uh, uh, the current administrator for FEMA and has been doing, that's doing so since uh, May of 2009. Prior to coming to FEMA, he served as the uh, Division of Emergency Management Director for Florida and, and had quite a bit of experience dealing with hurricanes and other sorts of uh, disasters. And prior to that, he served in his hometown in Gainesville in, in many uh, functions, starting as a volunteer firefighter up through the paramedic as well as their emergency management director. Uh, Craig's uh, title of his talk today is Emergency Management, a Community and Shared Responsibility. Thank you. I forgot to mention that you're in Florida. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, where's Brian Kuhn at? Hey, Brian, I, started, I, I, I saw you come up. I didn't get a chance to talk to you. I'll, I'll catch up with you after this, and I wore my gator tie, so... Uh, whenever they ask me what the topic is that I'm going to speak on, they usually give you some topic because I usually have no idea what I'm going to speak on until I've had my coffee that morning. Uh, and I was kind of intrigued by this bust of myth because we can't really use Mythbusters because that's actually trademarked. But uh, I thought I would talk about some things from the standpoint of the myths, how they affect public policy and decisions and why when we talk about community responsibility that somehow our job is made more difficult by some of these myths. So let's, let's talk seasonal forecast is, my, is, is one that um, it will get a lot of discussion this year. When people say something like a mild hurricane season or a quiet hurricane season, as Rick said, by that definition, if you look at the seasonal forecast, I think it's like one storm off from the 92 season. So it may be mild for you unless you get hit. Uh, the other thing I like about that is everybody talks about, you know, only one major hurricane. Like, we use that definition to talk about threes and above. But people confuse that and go, well, if it's not a major hurricane, it must be a minor hurricane. Uh, Sandy was not a hurricane when it made landfall. So what would you call that? A, you know, a minor what? Uh, you know, that's a... To give you some idea of the dollars, uh, supplemental appropriation by Congress, $60 billion for a non-hurricane making landfall. Now think about that. It was not a hurricane. By a lot of people's definitions, the wind speeds would have made it a minimal hurricane if it was even tropical. They use this term minimal. Now think about it. A $60 billion supplemental, and that's not covering all the private insurance losses, and all the additional costs and things that the federal government wasn't responsible for. Not to mention the loss of life or the disruptions that people are still out of their homes trying to figure out what's next. But by a lot of people's definitions, Sandy would have been minimal. So I, I look at this and I kind of go back to, you know, if you're asking me what I think about the seasonal forecast, I put a big A on your head for amateur. Because if you're asking FEMA, what does the seasonal forecast mean to us? I'm like, well, you're not in the business, are you? 
And one of the best examples I can give you of how we deal with seasonal forecast, it was 2010, and I can remember uh, we were briefing the president. Uh, NOAA went first, and they did the seasonal forecast. And when you brief the president, you have very specific time frames you're supposed to stay within. Uh, all of your slides have to be approved by the committee of folks that make decisions about what's going to be briefed to the president. And so we're sitting there, and this presentation kind of went long-winded and went very much over their allotted time, almost breathlessly talking about 2010, how active this hurricane season was going to be. So President Obama, we're all sitting in the sit room, he turns to me and says, Craig, based upon this active forecast for all of these storms, what is FEMA doing different to get ready? I said, nothing. And the president looked at me and says, uh, nothing? I said, sir, we get ready for hurricane season irregardless of a seasonal forecast. The forecast never tells us where they're going to hit or how many will make landfall. And it's not to say that seasonal forecasts aren't important because remember I said I wanted to talk about busting myths in public behavior? Well, seasonal forecasts are important, not for the way the media tends to look at them as some indication of whether you should get ready or not this year. What they're really important about, and for all you guys in Florida that have been covering this for a long time, what seasonal forecasts tell us in Florida is during some of the periods of our greatest growth, we had some of the least number of landfalling hurricanes. And so a lot of times what happens is we make policy decisions based upon people's known history. So here's another myth I run into. I've lived here all my life is the best indicator of whether or not I need to prepare or not. Well, I've been to a lot of areas that have lived there all their life and never had anything hit until it hit. In fact, the Wayne Saladay's here, I believe Charlotte County, when they formed as a county, had never had a landfalling hurricane make landfall in Charlotte County until Charlie made landfall. I seem to remember people here on the Treasure Coast doing the kind of like I thought they were pilots or something, that they would do this thing with their hands going, the reason we don't get hit with hurricanes is because the way the coastline of Florida is, once you get to north of Palm Beach County, they always curve out. So from basically Palm Beach County up until you get to the Outer Banks, they're immune from hurricanes because they always, they, they get their hands out and they show you the map. If you got a map and you're doing your hands, that's science. And they're sitting there and they're like, you see how the coast curves up like this and sticks out a little bit? So, you know, Martin County, Indian River, St. Lucie, they don't, the storms always curve away from there until they had two hurricanes land within 10 miles of each other in 2004. Um, our latest foray in trying to, another myth, you can have an actuarially sound flood insurance program that's affordable. Um, I heard from a lot of folks that didn't like our rates, and Congress decided to roll those back, which we are promptly doing as quickly as we can. But I asked, I asked a question, I said, let me get this right. Our maps are always wrong, we charge too much, and I don't flood then how'd the program end up $24 billion in debt? And everybody says, oh, that's New Orleans. It wasn't just New Orleans. It was a big chunk of the Mississippi coast. And it wasn't just one hurricane that year. And do you know where the greatest concentration of policies in the flood insurance program reside? Broward County, Florida. The exposure there is even greater than the current debt that's owed in the flood insurance program. So I look at risk and communicating risk in a way that is a little bit different. And as I've been doing this, I've come to the understanding of something. When we try to communicate risk to people for events which very fortunately don't happen on a frequent basis, and you're trying to get them to change behavior, and when I say change behavior, oftentimes that means saying something like, no, you shouldn't build there or you shouldn't build that way. We run into the issue of, well, now that's costing jobs and money, and I've lived here all my life, and people want to live on the coast, and why shouldn't we be doing that? And I'm like, you know, I'm not in the business of telling people where they can't and can't build. But I oftentimes find myself in that role because I also am responsible for the flood insurance program as trying to protect you, the taxpayer, and making sure we're not growing that risk. The whole purpose of the flood insurance program when it was created 
was to ensure the known risk and not grow the risk. Uh, for some reason, I think we grew the risk. Why? And this comes back to about the community. If we undervalue risk, we make decisions that are not sustainable. The problem is, in communicating risk, it's very difficult to explain to people what that risk looks like unless they've actually been impacted by it. So when you talk about potential risk of hurricanes, our best way of describing that is history. I remember when Dr. Chris Lansky and, and, and other folks put together some of the reanalysis of hurricanes, not the track of the storm, but what it would cost today by looking at all the economic factors, not just inflation, not just population, but wealth growth. And all of a sudden, the great Miami hurricane now becomes a $100 billion storm. And I think it keeps going up, Chris, because every time you reevaluate that, the increased value. Now think about that. The great Miami hurricane was a precursor to the Depression. It stopped the land boom speculation in Florida. And Florida immediately went into a recession and to a depression, even before the stock market crashed. Some of your more notable uh, journalists here have written books about other storms that have hit and that history, the Lake Okeechobee storm. And this is in Florida's history. The storms that have hit New Orleans, Houston. People in New York thought Sandy was the first time they ever had a tropical storm. I'm like, uh, no. There are pictures from the 40s and 50s of police officers standing in Times Square waist deep in water. It's flooded before. It's been hit before. But in trying to communicate risk, we have to change behavior. So that oftentimes puts you in this awkward situation. Is you're a local emergency manager saying, you know, we probably need to be looking at this development differently, or it doesn't really make a lot of sense to grow the evacuation population on barrier islands, and we can't even get people out now in time. But when you're going up against developers and other people whose interests are much different, and they're going before your local officials saying, this is about jobs, this is about tax base, this is about improving the infrastructure. And you don't have that many hurricanes. They're, they're, they're making it all blown out of proportion. Here's what I found. Change the question around and go, is this an insurable risk that's not subsidized? Because unless we can communicate what risk is in some other model then. I'm having to look at a lot of history, I'm having to look at a lot of impacts, and you're up there, up there having to talk about, is this a good investment for our community? What if there was no flood insurance program? What if you actually had to go to the private sector and ask people to invest in your risk? What would it cost you? Turns out, not much different than what proposed rates for FEMA. In fact, um, what we saw in Tampa Bay and some of the others in secondary homes and the uh, business market was about two-thirds of what we were charging, and they have a few more tools than the federal government does to manage that risk. But still, we were going from hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars, and the private sector only engaged in writing policies where you were at thousands of dollars. Policies where we would be charging 6000 private sector was coming in and saying, we could write that for 4500 to $4,000. People were previously paying hundreds of dollars. And we're talking about things like climate change. How do you build to the future? How do we know that in Sandy, we're not just mitigating the last 100 years? How many times have you heard this? It was a 100-year event. I hear this about weekly in my job. It's not a good term to communicate to people because they think a 100-year risk means it's a rare event that will only occur 100 years. Well, what it means is you've got a 1% risk. And I'm afraid that in some cases, we've underestimated that risk because we seem to be getting a lot of these 100-year events all over the place. So when you talk about flood insurance, you talk about other risk, we oftentimes are always looking backward. What was our history? What was the future like? So if I was doing land use planning and mapping and looking at everything in the 70s in Florida, and I wasn't here in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s, I would make the determination based upon my hurricane history, we can build away. The hurricanes went away. And nobody could really say why. Seasonal forecast taught us that there are cycles and that you see periods of lulls in activity. So when we start looking at how do we involve the community and communicate risk, we need to have the tools to not only look 
backwards, but how do you look to the future? What's changing? And whether or not you agree with climate change, here's a fact. Our populations and the capital invested in coastal communities has continued to decrease every year in some of the most vulnerable areas for tropical systems, which fortunately have not had a lot of activity. But Sandy was not a fluke. A lot, of, a lot of people call it, well, it was a fluke. It was just, it, it will, you know, it looks like it will never happen again. Yeah, it will. It's just a question of when. So how do you look at risk? How do you communicate risk? How do you tell people to change behavior, do things differently? And it's a big challenge because we tend to find ourselves dealing with disasters in the aftermath. Disaster happens, somebody's going to take care of you. Somebody from the outside is going to show up. Somebody's going to make you whole. It's not working that way. Most people forget that when disaster strikes, our programs at FEMA don't cover what insurance can cover. We cannot help you rebuild your home. We may only provide enough money to provide some temporary assistance and maybe help you do some very basic repairs. We're not making you whole. Our partners at Red Cross and others, again, all of our resources together, we cannot do what insurance can do. We cannot make families whole. There are still people from Sandy that have not recovered, that are still trying to figure out the next steps. And yet you as taxpayers have spent billions of dollars in relief efforts, and it still isn't enough. And these families, not only dealing with the tragedy of loss of life and injuries and losing all their possessions, they're still trying to struggle through, how do I afford to rebuild and can I rebuild? And in many cases, they want to rebuild right back where they were with not much different than how they were built before because they look at this as a 100-year event that won't ever occur again in their lifetime. So the challenge of how do you communicate risk and change behavior and getting people to understand that the subsidized systems that underwrite risk below which will change behavior will continue to grow risk. And from the policy perspective, most people say, well, that sounds like a bureaucratic answer. So I break it down very simply. And this is probably one of our best tools of communicating this. When people want to come in and build, develop, or grow in risk-based areas, ask the question, who's insuring the risk? Is it going to be the taxpayer? Or are they going to be able to afford private insurance? Can the commercial industry underwrite risk? And we know if we build and develop in certain ways, it becomes a very insurable risk. But instead of you having to say, this isn't a good idea because, ask a different question. Are we building in a way that we're mitigating risk where it is now insurable? And if it isn't insurable, what would it take? Or is this a good idea? Because if that risk isn't insurable, who pays when disaster strikes? You do. Whether you benefited or not from the development, when a risk is not insurable and a disaster strikes, who pays? You, the taxpayer. So when you're facing those planning departments, the zoning meetings, the commission meetings of the city and county, where you got the incessant drumbeat of build, develop, and grow, We've got to get jobs on there. We've got to fix our economy. We need the tax base. And you're trying to talk about what the risks are. You're going to increase evacuation times, the difficulty of managing that, how it's going to cost to respond to that event. And you're being told, hey, we're in southeast Georgia. We, we don't have a hurricane problem down here. That's the Outer Banks. That's a Florida problem. We're southeast Georgia we hardly ever get hit with a hurricane. Then ask this question, well, if the risk is so low, will the commercial sector write the insurance for that development? And the answer almost will always come back to, well, we have the National Flood Insurance Program. That program is subsidizing risk. And you're paying for it. And you will continue to pay for it. And to charge what those rates actually cost, are unaffordable for a lot of families. And so we are working diligently with Congress to find affordable solutions to the existing housing base. But think about new growth, new construction, redevelopment. How many times have you raised your hand 
or were shot down for me even bringing up the issue about evacuation clearance times increasing because this was jobs this was taxes this was growth and our answer was well when you look at the history and they go I've lived here all my life they're exaggerating the risk take a step back pause and go you're businessmen you're reasonable people take a little bit from Don Corleone and go I have no issue with your development so long as it's insurable by something other than a subsidized insurance program. They're businessmen, they're reasonable. All you're saying is as a tax paper, we're not socialist. Pay your way. If it's insurable, then we're good. If it's not insurable, we need to ask some hard questions. Does the taxpayer benefit enough from that development to offsize the transfer of the risk to the taxpayer? Because when you build something that's not insurable, you have transferred that risk to the taxpayer. That is not always necessarily a bad thing to do as long as the taxpayer gets the benefit of something greater than what those future costs are gonna be. So we talk about the public being prepared. We talk about all the things we need people to do to heat evacuation orders, to know what to do before a storm starts. But it all comes back to if you really want to buy down the risk and exposure to tropical systems, it is where and how we build. And this isn't about saying you cannot build in coastal communities. But there are ways to do it that minimize risk, provide jobs, allows development. But it's going to cost more money, and it is many times things that people don't want to do. So I asked a question, is this an insurable development? Is this building insurable? Can you do this without the flood insurance program? And if you can't, are we getting enough benefit? Because the best way I know to predict the future isn't always looking in the past. It's looking to see what people are willing to invest on future risk. And if it's not insurable, we probably have set the bar too low. April 30th is the National Day of Preparedness of America Preparathon. We know from our data that people are more apt to prepare rather than just saying be prepared. If you talk about specific hazards, one of those hazards will be hurricane. So in addition to all the other things you have out there on April 30th, uh, join with FEMA and a lot of folks in America's Preparathon. We're talking about wildfires. We're talking about hurricanes. We're talking about tornadoes. It's time to get ready before the next disaster strikes. And um, I don't know about you, but this conference is basically focused on the, uh, mainly the Atlanta tropical season, uh, you know, June 1st to November 30th. I also have to work on the East Pack hurricane season, starts May 15th. People forget California's actually been hit by tropical storms, and then we have Hawaii. And our responsibilities at FEMA go all the way across the international dateline to our territories with America, Samoa, Guam, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. And last time I checked, there's not really a season for cyclones. They just seem to be year-round out there. <laughs> so with that, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Daniel uh, Gernstein, who is the Undersecretary for Science and Technology in acting capacity of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Dr. Gernstein assumed this role uh, back in late September of last year. Before joining the Department of Homeland Security, Dr. Gernstein was a political appointee in the Office of Secretary of Defense, serving as a principal director for countering weapons of mass destruction. He started his career in the U.S. Army, serving on four continents. After retiring from the Army, Dr. Gernstein spent some time in the private sector he has also had some extensive experience in negoti international negotiations, having served on the Holbrook delegation that negotiated the peace settlement in Bosnia. Uh, he's had numerous uh, foreign, military, and civilian awards, and he's published numerous books and articles on national security, biological warfare, and information technology. Uh, Dr. Gernstein he graduated from the United States Military Academy and has master's degrees from Georgia Tech, the National Defense University of Command and General Staff, and a PhD in biodefense from George Mason University. 
Dr. Gernstein's talk today, will, the title of his talk today is Science and Technology and Preparedness Response and Recovery. Dr. Gernstein. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, participate in this great event. And I, I just want to uh, say congrats uh, to the organizers. Uh, this is a, a great event, and uh, it really is very timely given uh, the approaching season. Uh, it seems like I've drawn a tough spot. Uh, I'm behind two of the renowned uh, hurricane uh, aficionados in the entire United States, uh, in Rick and uh, Craig Fugate. And uh, so I'm going to try to do my best to stay on what I know best. Uh, I'll just uh, start with a couple disclaimers. And first is that I'm going to stay away from operations. I'm going to leave that to folks like uh, Rick and Craig who do this uh, full time. Uh, I also want to say I've got a slide presentation. Uh, you'll have to uh, bear with me. I'm a recovering DOD, Department of Defense, which means uh, I normally have PowerPoint charts and they're normally too busy. So we'll get through it, though. And, and I guess another disclaimer is I'm not a first responder by training. In fact, what I am, and in today's job that I work in, uh, I'm a technologist. And that is what we try to do is look at hard problems and bring in technology and analysis to try to solve those problems. And so today, uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, is to take you through a couple of things. First is to give you a thought or two about the nature of the challenge as we see it from an analytical perspective, and then talk a little bit about the Department of Homeland Security and the Science and Technology Directorate and how we do business. Now, my, my reason for doing that is at the end, I'm going to actually give you the tools so that you can interface with us if you have ideas about technologies or capabilities that you'd like to see brought in. The other thing I want to do is to, uh, to share with you what we're currently doing to improve the effectiveness, efficiency, and safety of first responders. So, uh, the first thing I'd like to talk a little bit about, and I promised I wasn't going to get into operations, so I'm going to stay on my side of it, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the analysis. We've already mentioned Sandy numerous times. Uh, it uh, turned out to be uh, the largest Atlantic hurricane, second deadliest uh, and costliest uh, to Katrina in 2005. Uh, it did somewhere between uh, 63 and $65 billion worth of damage. I think the numbers are still being totaled, and as Craig said, uh, we don't have a full accounting of all that was required from private uh, industry and insurance as well. Uh, it's incredible to think that it cut across 24 states. It hit the most populous place in the United States uh, and did extraordinary damage. In terms of fatalities, uh, the numbers are 117. Uh, but think about what was in that area as well. It uh, caused three nuclear reactors to have to go offline for a period of time, had trips and shutdowns. Uh, we had over 8 million businesses uh, that lost businesses and uh, people that lost power over 17 different states. And we had gas rationing in the United States for 15 days following the storm. Uh, and, you know, my most vivid memory of this uh, really was thinking about Secretary Napolitano during the height of the storm. She would convene a daily call where she would get all the leaders of the organizations together and talk about synchronizing the operation. And I remember she sounded every bit as much of a field general as I was used to when I was in the Army as she was talking to uh, the Commandant of the Coast Guard about clearing the ports so that we could get the fuel in, so that we could get the, uh, the uh, different areas, uh, the power plants up, so that we could begin to put up communications. And so it really does reinforce the nature of these storms. The real story, though, is look at the bottom insert on the slide. And what you see there is the insert, and it shows uh, the magnitude. And it, if you were to overlay this on the center of the country, it would actually have affected approximately a third of the country. So quite an astounding uh, issue. Now, as we look back at the storm, here's what I ask. You know, can we do better? What measures would make us more resilient as states, as communities, and as individuals? And we're finding, as we look hard at what the analysis is proving, is that it's not just about 
the states and the communities, but it's also about this concept of in individual resilience. And I think a lot of the discussions that Rick and Craig have already had get down to how do you get people to be more resilient, to take charge of their own lives in these events. We also need to think hard about aging infrastructure. That's going to be absolutely critical as we go forward. Now, as I think about the challenges and the threats and the risks the, of these hurricanes, I sort of put a cloud in here. But at the top of that cloud, I talk about this idea of the nature of cascading effects. And it truly does come home when you think about what occurred. We had a storm surge. The storm surge knocked out power plants. Because there was no power plants, we couldn't communicate with populations because their cell phones couldn't be charged. We couldn't pump gas because the gas stations uh, didn't have electricity. Uh, and so this kind of cascading effect is very damaging. And the question is, how do we do better in terms of trying to mitigate those sorts of effects? Uh, we had the disruption of the fuel distribution, we had storm debris, we had damaged infrastructure, we had lack of ability to move mass transit, uh, food distribution was affected, grocery stores flooded, uh, interoperability uh, between first responders, which has been and continues to be a, a key issue, uh, rose to the forefront here as well. So keep that in mind, the nature of cascading effects. Now, this is a chart of two tails, if you will. On the left side of the chart are the federal guidance and some examples that are listed there. And on the right side is from the state and local perspective. And in the center is this diagram that articulates the Stafford Act. And why I bring this up, and it's so important, is we have to find a way to harmonize the left side and the right side of the chart. Uh, I was actually working in the Army for the Under Secretary of the Army during Katrina. And when I think back to those times, we knew very early on that the levees were going to be topped. We knew that there was going to be a human catastrophe. The Corps of Engineers had done the modeling. They had given us enough data that we understood. But at the end of the day, it was the ability to communicate between the federal and the state and local that prevented uh, the ability to actually take action that, that perhaps could have uh, saved some lives. On the federal side, uh, we go back to uh, the founding of the department, the Homeland Security Act of 2002, and the powers that have been given. Uh, and of course, Craig uh, is, is intimately involved with those powers, certainly in the disaster area. Uh, when you go to the right side, though, uh, and you look at those harmonization of all the plans, the state, the communications, the, the strategic plans, the, the sector-specific plans, all of that has to come together. And it really meets right in the middle there. Now, at the same time, I don't want to lose sight of the fact, you know, I recognize I'm from Washington and everything looks different in Washington. But I don't want to lose sight of this notion that all response is local. And so the real key in my message is, what we're trying to do is to figure out ways to move technologies, capabilities, business process reforms down into state and local so that it can have an operational difference. I would never want anybody to think that, that we believe this is a federal response only. In fact, it's, you know, we are augmenting and assisting, but uh, we have to be mindful of the state and local. Uh, I, I promised I would just mention just for a second about uh, the Department of Homeland Security and then the Science and Technology Director. And I use this as a platform for talking about how we do business and uh, what, how you would interface with us. So the department was formed about a decade ago. Uh, it came together from 22 different uh, agencies. Uh, it was, uh, if you will, a culture of law enforcement and first responders. And one of the things that the department did not have was any sort of analytical or technical capability. And so one of the, the Congress of the United States decided that they, the department should have this sort of capability. And the Science and Technology Directorate became the organization that was uh, in the center of trying to bring these capacities forward. And so you see our mission statement at the top. It talks about being able to develop security and resiliency by providing knowledge products and innovative technology solutions. Uh, and that's, that's what we've been doing for the department. That's also what we've been doing uh, for uh, state and locals. Uh, and I'll talk more about some of the technologies that we have brought forward. 
You see listed down there about halfway through this idea of six uh, investment areas. At least three of those are directly related to first responders. Uh, so first responder technologies, uh, the borders and maritime, cybersecurity, uh, and resilience are certainly related to what we're talking about today. In addition, we have a chem bio defense capability and an explosives capability. Now what we try to do is develop operationally relevant solutions that are both innovative and, uh, if you will, partnering with both state and locals, but also other technologists throughout the globe, throughout the interagency. So who's our customer base? What this chart shows you is that what we're really talking about is a very broad customer base, starting over at the left with first responders. And I apologize that you can't see the numbers in there, uh, but in the, in the yellow oval, that represents 75,000 different law enforcement, emergency management, uh, different organizations within the United States, and all of them need to have some uh, support. And so hopefully, uh, you know, we are providing some support to the overarching, and then it trickles down to uh, the state, local, tribal, territorial level. We also support the, de the department's, what we call components. Uh, Craig, of course, runs one of the components in uh, FEMA, but it also includes Customs and Border Protection, the Transportation Security Administration, Secret Service, Coast Guard, Immigration Customs Enforcement, Customs and uh, Immigration Services, uh, and Office of Health Affairs. Uh, and then the federal interagency, and so we also get asked to support them as well with things like uh, hazard and plume modeling uh, and other support. Now what I want to do is transition the discussion a little and talk about uh, the different stages and what some of the technologies are that we're bringing forward and how uh, they can be impactful for you. This chart just shows you a number of graphics, but it breaks it out into uh, the PPD-8, if you will, the uh, Presidential Policy Directive 8 uh, document, which calls for prevent, protect, mitigate, respond, and recover. So let's look at some of the things we're doing in the uh, prevent, protect, and mitigate arena. We have something called centers of excellence, and one of our centers of excellence is at uh, the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. It's called the Coastal Hazard Center, and it's uh, been a tremendous uh, facility for assisting in uh, the modeling that's gone on. And in fact, a number of different entities are using the model that uh, they have developed. The model is called the uh, ADCIRC, the Advanced Circulation Surge Flooding Modeling. Uh, and it's being used currently by the Coast Guard, by NOAA. It's also uh, being used uh, by uh, the uh, Corps of Engineers. Uh, it's been very helpful in uh, trying to predict some of the flood flooding and some of the modeling that needs to go on. So modeling and simulation is very, very important. Uh, there's also uh, trying to do simulation and analysis of the uh, public safety broadband network. And this is an area where we feel we have great vulnerabilities. As we become more dependent on uh, the entire realm of cyber, the domain of cyber, uh, any sort of loss has dramatic impacts on our critical infrastructure. It has dramatic impacts on our basic daily, daily lives. Uh, we also are doing a lot within the infrastructure protection and resilience. Uh, and here I have four examples that I'd like to share with you. Uh, one of them is something called a tunnel plug. Uh, if you think back to uh, some of the issues that occurred in New York, uh, during Superstorm Sandy, many of the tunnels flooded. Had we had the tunnel plugs installed, these are uh, very large uh, plugs made out of a, uh, a very resilient material, and then they can be inflated, and when they're inflated, they seal the tunnel so that no water can get in. It's costly to do these sorts of infrastructure protection types of activities, but on the other hand, it was very costly to do the remediation of those tunnels. So uh, the tunnel plugs uh, could have been of use there. And we have a number of major cities around the uh, United States that have tunnels that would benefit from this. Uh, we also have something called a resilient electric grid. We're doing a prototype right now. Uh, the prototype is up in New York. 
it involves the Con Edison Electric Company. Uh, what we're doing there is we're taking, it's a specially designed cable, it's uh, cryogenically cooled so that it can handle great amounts of electricity, and it actually allows you to bypass uh, substations. So if one substation were to go down, if you knew you had one that was particularly vulnerable and you had this cable installed, then you would be able to bypass that station and it would serve to allow electricity to uh, go to places that would be under, uh, underserved or not served should the other substation go down. So it, again, very costly, but also we have to ask ourselves, is it something that we need to invest in, especially where we look at uh, some of the areas that are particularly vulnerable. If we know a substation uh, by modeling and simulation is likely to be uh, underwater in the event of, of uh, one of these events, then uh, we should, this may be an investment we wish to make. Uh, another technology that we've worked on is called our Recovery Transformer, or RecX. And RecX is a very innovative idea. Uh, here, uh, the recovery transformers, or the transformers that supply our nation's electrical system are very large, they're very expensive. Some of them have lead times of almost 18 months in order to put them into uh, operation. And what we have done here is we found a way to modularize and put the equivalent of a very large transformer on three flatbed trucks. And you can actually load it up on the trucks, roll it down to a new location, and within seven days you can have it operational. And we did one of these deployments. We moved uh, the recovery transformer uh, prototype down from Minnesota, and we installed it in Texas, and it's still operational. So it gives you some idea of what can be done. Probably too expensive for every state to have a RecX capability, but what if we had a RecX across each of the FEMA regions or something to that effect? In cybersecurity, we're partnering very closely uh, to try to build resilience. One of our studies is, is uh, working with the uh, na nation's power grid, trying to help with resiliency. Another one is helping with the oil and natural gas sector, again, to try to increase the resiliency uh, of these uh, types of capabilities. We're also doing a lot of first responder tools. In fact, when I leave here, uh, I'm going to see one of the tools that we've uh, got over at uh, organization in Atlanta, I'm sorry, in uh, Orlando, which is uh, owned by the Department of the Army, uh, but they're going to show us what they've been doing in terms of modeling for first responder capabilities. I now want to turn the, the uh, attention to uh, the mitigation and resiliency. And here uh, I want to start by saying that we understand that it has to be about partnering and not about directing. And so we, we do try to be a good partner along these lines. Uh, along the way, we, we try to build in resiliency, both as we develop new research and development solutions, but also as we begin to think about new infrastructure. What would the resiliency begin to look like? We also are strongly uh, believing in the training and exercises that are key uh, to uh, ensuring the readiness. Uh, my final one of the categories is response and recovery. And we've been talking a lot about this as Rick and Craig talked about uh, the ability to inform populations and make informed decisions. And I would say that this is an area where we're spending a lot of energy. Uh, the first uh, piece is called the alerts and warnings. You may have previously seen this in something called CMAS, uh, the commercial mobile alert system. It's been replaced by this wireless emergency alerts, but it's the idea of getting the alerts pushed down to individuals into places where they're highly proliferated so that the information gets out very rapidly. Looking at information and sharing and operational uh, interoperability, uh, here we've developed a multiband radio. I will tell you the single most important issue that first responders continue to complain about after whether it's the Boston Marathon bombing, whether it's a natural disaster, the single most important thing has been the inability to communicate on their radios. And we now have a, what we call the multiband radio, which allows for communications between first responders across different types of first responders, EMS, police, fire, uh, state and local, 
and state and local governments. And so the point there is that we have a solution. I know it can be an expensive solution if you were to try to replace all radios, but even if you replaced a subset so that key uh, people within your organizations had those, it would be certainly worth uh, doing. Another area is on sharing common operational picture or situational awareness. Here we've got something called Virtual USA. We've put this into the cloud. It allows for the sharing of information. You control your information, but you're able to share it so that people can understand where you believe you are and you can begin to make informed decisions. Uh, jumping down uh, on the national response teams and organization, uh, this is an interesting thing. We're starting to get involved in operational demonstrations. In this particular one, we did what we call a GIFX, a joint interagency field exercise out of Camp Roberts, and we did it in conjunction with the Army. A number of people from FEMA were there, and they tried a brand new concept, and the brand new concept was actually used in Norman, Oklahoma during the uh, horrific tornado season that was there, and they, they had piloted out at the GIFX these disaster recovery centers and the disaster survivor assistant teams, and they actually demonstrated how they could be beneficial, and in Norman, they actually did tremendous, tremendous work. So uh, that, was, that was a great finding. Another uh, area is in response equipment and technology, and here uh, we have something called Finder. Finder is uh, it's about the size of a small uh, suitcase, a roll-on suitcase, and it can be used to actually detect heartbeats in rubble. And it's very, very effective. We did a demonstration here. Another great capability, not very costly, uh, but it's something that I think uh, you know first responders would benefit greatly by. Uh, going down to the analysis and recovery here, I really should have titled this Big Data because essentially what we're talking about is the big data. We're talking about social media and the virtual social media work working group that we have. And here we're trying to understand what works, what doesn't work. We know, for example, that when you start to get a lot of uh, tweets coming over your Twitter, uh, that something is happening. But understanding what that something is, is not clear cut. And so we're doing analysis to try to figure that out. And my last slide is the one I promised you up front that I would talk about, and this is how do we work together? So the first thing is we have what we call a first responders resources group, and it's made up of state and local, tribal, territorial, federal first responders from across the United States. We have 130 representatives, and we meet regularly to take in requirements and to get feedback and to try to understand how your jobs can be made better through the use of technology or these business process reforms. I've given you a couple websites. Firstresponder.gov is there. That's a great place to go. Uh, we highlight many of our uh, requirements and our priorities. It also has the opportunity for you to tell us, uh, give us your feedback. Likewise, uh, we have the First Responders Community of Practice. Now, my First Responders group, group lead told me you are not allowed to go down there and talk to this conference without mentioning, and put it in red, that everything we do goes on the authorized equipment list, AUL, uh, a, I'm sorry, AEL. So the point is, you can use your grants for it, and that's the intent. And then on the other side, I've already talked some about uh, demonstrations. We also have a webinar series. If you want to hear about the webinars we're doing, you can go to uh, FedBizOps or to FirstResponder.gov. So uh, with that, I'd just say uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, lots of good stuff going on. We do want to hear from you uh, because it's, it's really your feedback that's going to make us more resilient uh, and better prepared for this hurricane season. Thanks. Our final speaker in this morning's sessions is Karen Durham Aguilera. He's a professional registered engineer and is currently the director of contingency operations of the Homeland Security Office and headquarters of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, that directorate provides command and control of U.S. Army Corps of Engineers civil and military contingency operations and leads the development of command contingency, um, excuse me, development of command contingency doctrine and maintains readiness. Um, Karen was most recently director of the task force, HOPE, in New Orleans, Louisiana, 
not only the Corps, and she was responsible for development and execution of the Corps' $14.6 billion hurricane protection system work for New Orleans and southeast Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina. Um, she's a registered, as I said, a registered professional engineer in the state of Louisiana, and she holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in civil geotechnical engineering, both from the University of Louisville. I thought you were going to embarrass me by uh, over-reading that biography, but thank you. Um, hey, good morning. You know, it's really good to be here, and I always enjoy listening to, uh, to uh, Rick Nabb and Administrator Fugate, and I was, uh, I was really pleased to see how much of the active lessons learned uh, that we have ongoing, uh, especially when Rick talked about all the different prototype and the, and the uh, advanced warning systems for predicting how far inland search could go in the depth. That is something we hear from the communities all the time, so it, it's really great to see the uh, Weather Service uh, working on that. And then Craig said something that really stuck into my mind is then, uh, we get ready regardless of the seasonal forecast. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, kind of the background on the core and, and what we do to, to be ready. And we take an all hazards contingency response. So it's not just a hurricane. Uh, we are uh, always getting ready for any type of hazard that could occur, you know, flooding, hurricane, tornadoes, the effects of wildfires and, and so forth. You know, a little bit of that is, uh, you know, Craig said about history. Well, if we go back in time in, in this country, there were always things that happened that caused us to make decisions. And for the Corps of Engineers, we just tie all those decisions back to water, water, water resources, and the infrastructure, to the way that we uh, settled on the river in the first place. Um, the infrastructure that it put in place to include the highway systems, uh, the big dam era uh, that happened throughout the 1900s, particularly in the 1930s and the 1950s. Uh, what we did originally in the Florida Everglades that we're trying to reverse today, and of course the huge decisions and the changes were made uh, past uh, Hurricane Katrina. You know, for Hurricane Sandy, that history is still unfolding and that story is yet to be told. But there's lots of uh, operational decisions and changes that are being made as a result of Hurricane uh, Sandy. And I'll talk more about those in a minute. Uh, for the Corps, we, all, we are the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We do have contingency operations across the whole spectrum, whether it's water resources, the environment, infrastructure, of course, responding to disasters and uh, support of the warfighter. And one of the reasons that, that I believe the uh, Army Corps of Engineers is able to do all these things is because you know, we have an ongoing operational mission all the time. And, in, and for civil works, uh, that's everything from the emergency management to recreation, hydropower, the ecosystem restoration, but especially everything to do with water, from water supply to water quality, and the things we do for the flood and coastal storm risk reduction. Um, you already saw some of this earlier. Everything that we do is, of course, is, is under the national frameworks and the uh, uh, policy directive, uh, the national response framework. Uh, we are emergency support function three, public works and engineering. We're basically FEMA's federal engineers. And then the real-time implementations in a big way since Sandy is the National Disaster Recovery Framework, and the Corps of Engineers leads the infrastructure system. And that doesn't mean we direct other federal agencies, but what it does mean is we try to leverage whatever, what can be done and to coordinate everybody's activities so we're not working uh, independently of each other. It is an all-hazards response. The Corps of Engineers has our own civil works authorities. Most people know this as flood fight. Under Public Law 8499 and our flood control and coastal emergencies, this is the way that we prepare and train our teams, the way we go out and do flood fights, uh, advanced measures from temporary levees to handing out sandbags to providing pumps, and then the repair of the systems themselves uh, after the event. And then, of course, um, the support to the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA uh, once the Stafford Act uh, is in place. And then under the Department of Defense, uh, we do support the uh, Army um, combatant commands uh, really around the globe. But, but having to do all of these things means that we have a very, uh, we have a dedicated and, and technically trained and certified workforce that we're able to go out and deploy really in very quick time to anything that could happen. Some of the things we do under public works and engineering, um, and again, we're responsible for these functions, but that means we're also responsible to leverage anything we can, uh, other federal agencies, you know, our contractors, and we're also um, increasing our leverage of the National Volunteer Organizations Active in Disasters, or the NVOADS, 
so that we can actually get them to help take on some of these missions. To include, uh, some of the things we do is temporary emergency power. These are mostly generator installs to provide power when critical facilities go out, such as hospitals, fire stations, schools, and, and other things. Uh, the debris management, everything from just the technical assistance to a full scope uh, debris uh, removal. Uh, provision of water and commodities, critical public facilities, and temporary housing. Uh, urban search and rescue, where we are not the responders, but we have structural engineers that are specialists that can go in and advise if a damaged building is safe to enter, such as we did after 9-11, and we've done, uh, we sent these teams out to different parts around the globe. And then we have the legal authority to subtask other agencies. So in, in Sandy, for example, we were able to mission assign the Navy Supply and Salvage and the Coast Guard to help us um, unwater the flooded uh, subway transit systems. I already talked about what we do under our flood fights. And those are some of the temporary works. That's a, that's a sandbag operation in the front, and a temporary levy is, is that later picture. But this is also the way that we mitigate. You know, we're always looking for ways that we can work with the community and other federal agencies to reduce the impacts that could occur, you know, from the next event. Um, we're operational all the time, and I know you can't read this, but this is just to let you know that we have a battle roster, uh, dedicated response teams from across the nation for all these different specialties, infrastructure, housing, temporary power, debris removal, and several others. And then we have our field engineering support teams, which is a combination of military and civilian personnel, a 249th engineering battalion, which is a prime power. And then we do have pre-positioned emergency response contractors. So this dedicated team of people is about 2,000. And then on top of that, you know, we can leverage uh, anyone within the entire Corps of Engineers to help uh, respond uh, to an event. We also do a lot of international humanitarian disaster assistance where we'll send teams out on response to other countries, such as we did for the record flooding in Australia, the earthquakes in New Zealand, uh, the flooding that occurred in Thailand. I could give numerous examples. Um, I got here, uh, we basically are engaged in 132 really countries. We actually have offices so in 43 countries. I came here directly from New York City, where we had a, a visiting delegation from the Czech Republic. Uh, they had a similar situation themselves with the flooded subway system. So they asked, uh, they reached out to me after Sandy to try to do a technical exchange lesson learned for the things they did to unwater their subway system. But even more importantly, all of the measures that they're taking um, to basically flood proof and reduce uh, different points around the city uh, for the next event. So we're able to meet directly with the New York City Mass Transit Authority, the Office of Emergency Management, a lot of our technical folks. You know, it's a different country, it's a different languages, but the challenges are the same. So one, one takeaway I had in, in listening to the, uh, uh, Dr. Gernstein before me is the, uh, the New York Mass Transit Authority did go out and they put uh, measures in place in about 1,200 different locations to reduce the amount of water that can come into that subway system. Everything from plywood around stairwells to, to sandbags, you know, different points of entry. But they did it for an 11-foot surge. Well, the surge was 14. So the surge overtopped some of their measures, but the thing they said they weren't prepared for is the force of that surge brought in debris, and that debris that was carried in broke right through some of their barricades. So some of the things that they're doing right now is uh, they call it putting hard lids in, actually putting in an aluminum panel to cover up the vents, and there's 40,000 vents in that subway system. Uh, put in panels to cover up the stairwells, you know, to uh, cover up the, where the electrical systems, even an inch gap could bring in a million gallons of water. So, you know, it's a hard lesson to learn, but, but to get together and figure out what other protective measures can be, can be put in place in a practical way, you know, is, is just what's going to benefit the community for the next time something happens. Yeah, I ran out of room on this slide. You know, we had so many things going on in 2011 and 2012. You know, we had tornadoes, tropical events couple of hurricanes such as Hurricane Irene, you know, different other events around the globe, you know, wildfires. And, and so we're always preparing, recovering, you know, preparing, responding, recovering, or mitigating, you know, for the next event. And since this is only uh, April in 2014, I'll probably run out of room on this one too. Of course, we spent most of 2013 and the program continues today recovering from uh, Hurricane Sandy. But... An event may not be big enough to gather national attention, but it sure is big for the people that live there. 
you know, some of the events that happened last year was uh, the flooding in Colorado. We still have a recovery team on the ground helping all those mountain teams recovery. Uh, the uh, flooding that resulted from ice jams in Alaska, still have teams on the ground there helping the state of Alaska, especially for some of these remote areas recover. And then right now, today, it's spring, so what does that mean? It means river flooding. So we have emergency operations center activated in Mississippi uh, and other parts for uh, a flooding that's occurring right now along the Pearl River and other tributaries. Uh, we're out there work, helping with the, uh, the local entities do their flood fight to try to uh, reduce flooding to the extent possible well, just from the type of spring flooding that occurs every year. Some of the other things on this slide that we end up responding to, the uh, fertilizer plant explosion in West Texas last year. Some of the things that we do, did to help FEMA support uh, the uh, governor's mission on the ground was technical assistance for debris removal. So regardless of what the event is, you know, we have uh, enough technical experts to be able to send uh, just about anything. So Hurricane Sandy, we've already talked about the size of this, and it really was a storm that affected several states, went very far inland, and it was a, a hurricane, a tropical event, rain and snow you know, all that occurred uh, in, in pretty close. So one of the things that we've done as the lessons learned is we get with FEMA and we, pre we pre-position teams as much as we can prior to a storm. So we send out our, our uh, temporary power teams, our 249th Engineering Battalion, a lot of supplies, and we locate our folks at the different staging bases that FEMA has already set up in agreement with the Department of Defense and with the locals so that we have our response teams as close to the event as we can. And even with doing all of that, um, I don't think anyone was quite prepared for the damage that occurred, especially in such a highly uh, industrial area. Even the year before for Tropical Storm uh, Lee and Hurricane Irene, people didn't quite take those lessons learned for the individual preparedness. Even things as simple as filling their cars up with gas turned into a huge, huge problem after Sandy with the fuel stations that were in and out, the lack of power, and then the problems with distributing fuel. So, Getting that message out to the community, what things can do as individuals, you know, as well as what, what uh, we can do you know, with uh, federal, state, and local planning just provides uh, more benefits later on. I mean, we can't emphasize that enough. I spent several years living in the Gulf states, and I always had uh, my personal flyway kit that my family had, and then I had my flyway kit as, as one of the government responders as well. These are pictures of some of the damage. Uh, between the uh, breaches along the coastline, the flooded subway systems. Uh, we ended up on watering 14 different uh, subway systems. Uh, the ferries that went out that were important because that's how people get back and forth there. Uh, you know, the, just a hu huge, huge amount of damage. So at the peak of this response, we had about 1,000 people on the ground directly engaged in support to the states. One of the biggest things we did was all the different debris removal through the state of New York and especially New York City. Uh, it really was just a huge effort, partly due to the heavy population base, but then also had to sort, to sort out all the hazardous materials and vegetation and everything that gets all mixed up when you have a debris mission. Another challenge was the temporary housing. You know, people uh, uh, really want to be able to stay in their homes. Uh, FEMA did issue a, or uh, start a pilot project of, of doing wrapper repairs in place, mostly to doors and windows so people can get back in. So we had various stages of success. And in New Jersey, we actually did provide temporary housing by a Fort Monmouth, which was an Army base that had been closed. We were able to, and it was under a BRAC probe, and we were able to actually get back in there and convert the, uh, the former Army housing um, to convert it into, into housing for families. So there's lots of different ways, and that we continue to work with FEMA on, on better ways to do housing. And the state of New York and the city they have a lot of pilot projects of their own to try to do rapid housing, you know, very close to neighborhoods uh, should they get hit. Um, there were a lot of initiatives signed into law by the president called the Sanity Recovery Improvement Act. Some of these that the Corps is contributing to that we actually use for the uh, tornadoes hit in Oklahoma City or the flooding that occurred in Colorado or Alaska. One of them was a pilot program for debris removal, and this really provides a lot of uh, uh, financial uh, incentives. Uh, for the local entity to do their own debris removal. But it works the best if you already have a, a, a debris management plan in place and even an emergency contractor. Uh, the Corps of Engineers can still go in and provide that technical assistance to upfront planning. Of course, if an event is big enough and FEMA asks us to, with agreement from the state, we will go in and do the debris removal. And then another thing that's different that's been used numerous times over the last year 
is a tribal government support where a disaster declaration can be declared directly for tribes. They do not have to go through states, so there's, there's numerous efforts on going there right now. Uh, we're doing a lot of work uh, now in New Mexico and uh, Nevada uh, to help tribes, especially in areas that have been affected by wildfires. Now you have bare hillsides. We have nothing to stop the uh, flooding that occurred by rain. And then FEMA and some of the, re the listening sessions this morning talked about the expedited public assistance or their direct fixed grants. So this is where an applicant can submit a design build risk-based cost estimate and get their money up front uh, to go in and do uh, improvements after an event, even to, to do a lot of projects bundled together. And so on, after the request from FEMA, uh, we have over 200 cost estimators in the Corps of Engineers as well as architect engineers so we'll go in and do a third-party verification that the, the cost estimate is reasonable, and that speeds up FEMA and ag agreeing with the applicant, and especially speeding up the recovery. You know, we've had these themes all day today about buying down risk and a shared responsibility. This is a collective, a collective responsibility, everything from zoning and building codes to insurance to evacuation plans to structural solutions such as levees, flood walls, and other structures, but also the things that we do to lessen the impact for what we're doing with uh, some of the environmental features. I was really struck after Sandy hit. I was on the ground a couple days later. And I, I thought I was back in Louisiana because when we were working along different parts that were affected, uh, every area that had a uh, engineered beach or a sand dune, you know, that had a berm, had room between the coastline and the property, had an elevated home and an anchored foundation, they received the least amount of damages. But right next to them, if their neighbor did not have an anchored foundation or elevated, their house looked like a, a broken V. It's the same thing we saw on the Gulf Coast by houses that were literally uplifted by all the water that came in. So the, even though those aren't hard structural solutions, they make a lot of difference. So we're working right now for, for a lot of other mitigating measures, you know, things that are pretty simple to do. They absorb the energy of the storm, and then you have to replace them, but... Um, they, act, they do a lot of good and, and prevent a lot of damage from occurring. So post-Hurricane Sandy, besides all the lessons learned and the actions with recovery, that's the first time we really implemented the national recovery um, framework in a, in a really big way. And almost as soon as the emergency phase uh, hit, uh, we embedded people with the federal teams and the, and the JFOs. So we can immediately start working on recovery strategies, mostly with New York and New Jersey, as well as the federal piece. Uh, we did receive a $5.4 billion supplemental. For us, that means a big construction program. So it's repairing the existing work that we're doing right now. We should, we'll be finished with that by the end of this calendar year. Repairing our own operating plants, some of our dams, locks, and other areas. But the bulk of that, about $3.3 billion, is going to be for new construction work that was authorized but never funded and never built. Uh, so we'll be doing that for the next few years. And then there is a, a long-term $20 million recovery strategy called a comprehensive, where we're working with uh, the state of New York, New Jersey, and all the other federal entities, the Mass Transit Authority, and lots of others, to talk about what type of resilience measures can you put in place to mitigate the effects of the next storm. I mentioned some of the real-time examples that the Mass Transit Authority was doing right now. I'm just going to flash through a couple of pictures just to make the point that this affected the entire northeastern seaboard. So these are the uh, projects that are already in place. Most of them are the hurricane uh, shore damage protection projects or berms, engineered beaches. But what you notice, there's gaps between them. So every place there was a gap was where the water could come in and do even more damage. Um, these are operating plan. Again, notice there's a lot of them in the state of Florida. So when we talk about Sandy, it's not, not just not New York and New Jersey. It's other states as well. Um, so I'll just keep passing through this. And then this is another one that kind of surprised me. Um, we have a regional office in Cincinnati, Ohio, covers the Great Lakes and Ohio Rivers Division. Well, look how far inland the damage went. So we have all of these projects, you know, by being repaired as well, you know, due to the effects of Hurricane Sandy. This is a comprehensive that I mentioned. Uh, we have uh, a lot of external uh, stakeholders uh, helping us with the solution on this. We also have some external peer reviews and, and help from the uh, Rockefeller Institute and a lot of others. So we have the f uh, an ongoing draft of this done now. Our goal is to get this finished uh, and submitted to Congress by January of 2015. And then what it will do, provide a suite of alternatives of what you can do further and, and what else can be done in infrastructure to increase resiliency. Um, so this is a project that we, should, uh, we track all the time. You see some pictures of the work. 
But the other thing we're doing is, is a constant lessons learned, and what can we do to get better? So here we are about for hurricane season, and, and when, when Rick, Dr. Nab was talking earlier, and, um, and, and Craig also emphasizing not to get caught up in the uh, in seasonal forecast, and I think I, I advanced this without meaning to. There you go. So some of the things we're doing to help uh, get ready, uh, regardless of the forecast, um, a, lot of, a lot of what we do are the, uh, this thing's haunted, it's moving itself, is uh, having regional exercises. And when I, when I leave here tomorrow, I'm going to Atlanta, where we've got a, a regional exercise going with FEMA Region 4 and uh, the state, uh, the tag from the state of Florida. So we do a lot of uh, hurricane exercises. We'll be doing them along the Gulf Coast, as well as the northeastern coast. Um, we also have a, a Corps of Engineers and a FEMA Senior Leader Seminar where we look at what changes we need to make throughout all the Corps and FEMA regions, but we have our interagency partners in, in, invited as well, um, such as the uh, Department of Defense, uh, the Veterans Affairs, just lots of different folks. So we even invited the National Volunteer Organization Active Disasters uh, Headquarters Office in D.C. as well. And then we do a lot of training. We do a lot of internal training, but we also do out and, and do community training especially for flood fights and readiness exercises. And if, if you don't do that, then we're all not going to be ready. Um, in January of each year, we start working with the navigation industry and a few of our core districts located in New Orleans, Mobile, and Galveston to talk about, and the Coast Guard, to see what measures can we do about the Gulf and Coastal Canal. So anything we can do to help everyone get ready for training, exercise, preparing, and that's what we're really focused on because the more we do that ahead of time, the better off we are when an event actually occurs. And then we look at uh, reconfiguring our teams and whatever, any, any type of other doctrinal changes we have to make, such as the prescriptive mission assignments we have with FEMA that allows us to get out quickly, even on a verbal agreement, basically within a few hours. So those are, those are, these are the type of things we do all year long and every year. Okay. And now this thing doesn't want to move. But anyway, that was my... Uh, Last one, I, I tried to make this really quick, so um, I, I hope that you found some value in me sharing some of the things we're, we're doing. Thank you. Thank you.